How do we learn to put our faith in grace? I've already laid out this morning in opening remarks that there's a journey of education. There's a journey of learning. I, I remember there was a time that I hated school. <laughs> yeah, Jackson. There was a time that I hated school. Oh, I'd trade places with you in a heartbeat, but I wouldn't want to go back to the grade that you're in. I'd love to go to graduate school because I love to learn. See, I'm, it, I don't think we're ever done learning. And I think it's what the Bible is trying to communicate to us. A few weeks ago, I asked the question that God asked in Genesis chapter 3. He asked three questions. Where are you? Who told you that? What have you done? I'm still playing with those questions, but in a different way. Where are you? i found that along the way that I have discovered myself in Eden. How about you? You know about Eden? You know about that place? It's the place where you feel like you're in sin. Scared to death of God. Making all kinds of excuses. Trying to hide. That's the reason why I talk about shame, guilt, and blame. It's because those are the words that best describe what it's like for me to be in the Garden of Eden. But you see, I don't know what it's like for you. And how can I help you and equip you if I don't understand you and your perspective? That's part of the role of pastor. It's not about me. It really is about you. And it really is about God's call upon your life. Just as we all exited elementary school and went into high school or middle school, depending on how good our education system was. The point that I'm trying to make is we don't take an eraser and erase everything that we learn from kindergarten, if you were lucky enough to go. I don't think they had it when I was a kid. I don't think it had been invented yet. But we don't erase it, do we? We carry it with us. Not only in the high school, but my goodness, we carry it all the rest of our life, don't we? So it is with sin. So it is with shame and guilt and blame and arguments and debates. And if you don't believe that, look at Washington. If you don't, if you don't believe that, look at the United Methodist Church and General Conference. If you don't believe that, watch the evening news. But God is with us. God is with us. Where are you? Well, sometimes you have to answer that. Sometimes we just find ourselves in Eden. Sometimes we have to go back and remember what it's like to be in fifth grade and retool ourselves and learn those lessons all over again. But there's other places that God calls us. Where are you? How much time have you spent at Mount Sinai? Not just so you don't get confused. Isn't it great? It's Mount Sinai. It's Mount Sin Ai. <laughs> Sin is right in the middle of the word. Have you, have you missed that? In other words, God has got a sense of humor saying, well, now that you're at the base of the mountain and I'm going to give you these Ten Commandments, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to forget what you learned in the garden. Because you see, once you figure out that you have sin in your life, isn't it true? It just makes sense that we need some rules. We need some boundaries. So that we don't kill each other. Remember that story? Adam and Eve's children, what were their names? One killed the other, and we've been doing it ever since. Where are you? Sometimes we're in Eden. Sometimes we're at Sinai. I think we all know the Ten Commandments pretty well. 
I think we know them well enough to know that we can't keep them. We'll argue about over what they mean. Well, that calls us to another place. If the Garden of Eden is elementary school, then Mount Sinai and the giving of the commandment must be middle school. Bet you never broke one of the rules. You never got your hand or your hind end paddled, did you? I'll tell you right now, one of the things wrong in the public education system ain't about beating kids, but I am about respect. And when we lost it in school, I think we also lost it for one another. I'm meddling. I know when I'm preaching and when I'm meddling some of the time. You know all the time. And so God gave us the law at Mount Sinai. But don't forget, I've tried to teach this, that the people heard God and were scared half to death, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. And they walked away and they kept. They learned something. They learned the Ten Commandments. But then they sat down and they tried to figure out what they all meant. One of my favorite theologians, lay theologians, this church helped me with this. Read the book of Leviticus, it's different than Sinai. Read the book of Leviticus, and you'll find all kinds of explanations. They're trying to figure out this whole big, long, sacrificial worship system so that they can find their way to some sense of forgiveness with God. And so now they're in high school. Remove from sin. And when we're ready, God will give us the law. And when we, think our, when we think we're full of it and that we can judge one another, he'll introduce us to Leviticus. And I'm pretty sure that I have been, and most of the clergy and the bishops of the United Methodist Church and the pastors in Western Christianity are pretty much stuck in the book of Leviticus. Are we smarter? Are we smarter than the Holy Spirit? Are we smarter than God? And so we end up there with temple worship, the keeping of the letter of the law, and a sacrificial system. But here the good news, there was hope, because in the middle of all of that, there was a the day of atonement. And it didn't matter where you were from, if you were in the land of Israel, on the day of atonement, everyone was made right and holy before God. Wrap your head around. God makes his people holy as he is holy. Why? Because he loves, and any parent knows that. And if a parent can do that, or a teacher can do that, or a preacher can do that, how much more can God do? And so we're called. Rob, I think. I don't know. It seems that we're called to reflect the image of God. And so if we're in Eden... Or if we're in Sinai. Or if we're following after the jots and the tittles of the Levitical law, it's the same God who is with us yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But you see, God has another place that He calls us. And we're ready. He will bring us and He will deliver us. And that place is called Calvary. And Jesus said that he fulfilled it. He didn't say he wadded everything up and threw it all away. Why? Because God is smarter than a fifth grader. Nope. Don't hear any incoming. I got away with that one too. So hear me. You see, I think all the Apostle Paul is trying to get us to understand. All he's trying to get us to understand is how to answer the question, where are you? You see, it's an honor and a privilege to meet somebody in the Garden of Eden struggling with sin. You see, that's what I'm called to. 
Because Jesus was not afraid to be in the presence of sinful people. There's, there's nothing wrong. It's a wonderful and glorious thing to be with people who are stuck in that black and white realm of the world. Oh, I love it. I wish I could go back to the point personally where things were just so resolute and so simple. Andrew will tell you I go there occasionally. Time or two I thought it was going to be grounds for divorce. Y'all still haven't figured out my sense of humor. Here's the long and short, I'm going to shut up. The Apostle Paul sees that the journey from Eden to Mount Sinai and to the temple and all of its practices and to Calvary is a journey that brings us to a very special place. Paul says that quite literally that we are in Christ Jesus. My friends, that's not a system of belief. That's not rules and regulations. Patty, I appreciated what you did this morning. I needed to hear that story. I had this thought the other day, and my garden friends are not going to hear it very well. And those standing on Mount Sinai, oh, not going to handle this well. And those in Leviticus and the temple practices, probably not going to hear this very well. And I'm telling you, because I fight with it too. God created the heaven and the earth. Most of my life, I thought that God created from here and put that over there. And now I understand that what the Apostle Paul is saying is, oh no, oh no. God created the heavens and the earth in Himself. And He never left it. And He never departed it. And he never turned his back on it. But we did. And to come to Christ. Paul says that to come to Christ is to have our eyes open to be able to see the glory of the Lord and the weightlessness of the cross as it takes the weight of sin off the soul. And that I shall preach. And I really don't care what side the general conference picks because God will find us all in all if we're smarter than fifth graders. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Father, you'll have to clean this mess up. I'm just smart enough to make it. Amen.